Consulting Group, partner and MD, Lucas Chamonte, to discuss climate change issues in the mining industry. Welcome, Lucas. Lucas, can you begin by telling us about the effects of climate change and what this has on the mining industry and whether this risk is expected to increase in future? So the climate change risk is already disrupting the mining industry uh, quite uh, seriously already. Uh, we can see that at uh, various levels. First, in terms of demand for commodities, obviously. Uh, for example, uh, demand for coal already affected from both the demand side and the funding side. Uh, companies are facing difficulties more and more to fund new projects in those commodities, uh, including uh, PGM, uh, Platinum Group uh, as well. Uh, the demand for uh, diesel and gasoline cars where this uh, commodity is being used uh, is affected. And on the other hand, we see demand for other commodities like uh, uh, copper or battery metals to, to increase. Uh, this is already happening and we think that this is going to increase uh, drastically. So they are, they are really affected. That's on the, more on the demand side. Uh, mining companies are also affected by the consequences of climate change. Climate change is not only something that we predict for the future. Climate change is happening already. Uh, there are extreme weather uh, events happening already. So they are affected by um, scarcity of water, which is a key resource required for the mining industry as well as flooding, for example. So they are affected by both uh, the demand as being a cause of climate change and they are affected by the consequence of climate change. And this is just the beginning. So uh, to, the, to your question, yes, uh, we expect that to increase and to actually accelerate. Okay, perfect. And as a bit of a cause of climate change, um, what can the mining industry do to mitigate some of these effects that they are having on the environment? So there are many things that they could do and they should do, I would say. Uh, what is important to start with is to have a holistic approach. Uh, if you, uh, and it's what we observe, if you do uh, fragmented actions without a holistic approach, uh, the likelihood of having limited impact and having an impact that is not well understood externally is quite high. Uh, so a few elements that are important. The, f the very first one is the long-term strategy. Uh, it's important, the world is going to look very different in the next 20, 30 years. Uh, from a demand perspective, uh, but also consumer behaviors, uh, uh, what is uh, possible to do, not to do, uh, access to resources. So it's important that the companies acknowledge that and uh, develop a strategy that is resilient, not against a unique and deterministic future, but multiple futures. There's also a lot of uncertainty. So uh, companies need to develop scenarios and test uh, their strategy against various scenarios. That means that the, the strategy needs to have some optionality uh, and some flexibility depending on how the, the future uh, develops. So that's the first thing, uh, a change in the way they develop a strategy uh, to manage uncertainty. The second one is more on the operational side. Uh, it is uh, extremely important to start today uh, ambitious uh, CO2 reduction programs and uh, the requirements of those programs are a bit similar to uh, cost reduction programs in a way that requires uh, cross-company uh, programs with uh, project management uh, excellence, uh, ownership, uh, operating model changes with incentives and rewards to, to really deliver uh, on the objectives with the same rigor and discipline as you would do uh, on a cost uh, turnaround, for example. Right? And uh, the third uh, element that is critical is uh, engaging with the stakeholders. And when we talk about stakeholders, we talk about the entire ecosystem, the employees, the investors, the NGOs, uh, the communities, the customers, the suppliers, all the... And it's important to start with uh, a clear uh, purpose and vision. Uh, what, why is the company uh, going to be relevant in 30 years from now? Imagine a, a coal miner or, or, or some other type of process industries. Um, why will they be relevant in the future? What would make them relevant? Uh, what societal need will they serve? Uh, having that as a, as a start and then uh, communicating and articulating what is going to be the roadmap, what are going to be the actions. So even if not everything is perfect today, there is a good understanding of where the company is going and what the path is. I think this is extremely important to, uh, to get the buy-in and the support from all the stakeholders. It's important also to attract talent, to attract capital uh, and to get buy-in from the communities. So very important that uh, stakeholder engagement. 
The other important element within the stakeholder engagement is understanding that the climate issue cannot be solved alone. Um, like for example, uh, when we talk about phasing out coal or things like this, we cannot have coal mining companies developing a plan, uh, utilities, power companies doing another plan, process industries doing another plan. They need to understand that the solution has to be uh, holistic and has to be uh, consistent uh, and, not, uh, and companies should not be trying to guess what the others will do, but instead collaborate and develop joint plans. I think that's uh, extremely important and very relevant to South Africa in particular. Nicholas, while there are companies that are doing their bit to mitigate the effects of climate change, do you believe that they're being ambitious enough with their plans in doing so? Um, ambitious enough, maybe yes. Uh, are they doing enough? No. <laughs> so it's a little bit of a difference. Uh, I, I think, I, I don't know, the, the ambition, the communicated ambition are not very high at the moment, uh, maybe not up to the challenge. Uh, very few companies actually communicate uh, concrete ambitions uh, in the long term. They tend to, com to uh, communicate uh, ambitions in the shorter term with their visibility of what they can do. Uh, but I think the acknowledgement, uh, at least in the past two or three years, has accelerated a lot. I think companies do understand that this is a big challenge and that a big change is required. There's still a bit of wait and see uh, because no real player has really put forward a, a very clear and, 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 and has, has needed a strategy for the future. So there's a bit of that and a bit of trial, but I think the acknowledgement is there. And I think everybody or almost everybody has it high on the agenda. So I expect in the next few years to, do, to see a lot of acceleration in, in uh, companies putting uh, ambitions, uh, communicating them quantitative or not, uh, I think it's very difficult for a company to say today uh, by how much they will reduce their emissions, by how much they will uh, change, or how far they will change. But uh, yeah, so I think the awareness is there, the ambition is coming, and hopefully the concrete actions and results uh, will follow as well. Yes, for sure. We are waiting to see a bit of action and we do hope to see that in future. But just moving on to my next question then, um, how can mining companies now future-proof their operations to mitigate some of the effects that climate change are having on their operations? So to future-proof the operations, um, I think the very first step that I think every mining company uh, should take, or even every company in fact, is to develop what we call a, an abatement curve, which is basically looking at the long list of levers uh, that would reduce uh, the carbon footprint and looking at the cost of those uh, levers. So typically in such abatement curve, uh, we see at the beginning uh, uh, energy efficiency levers, how to consume less uh, energy or even consume less raw material in general that have themselves some, uh, some footprint that you can reduce. Um, then we have levers around the type of electricity or the type of energy that those companies are importing for their operation uh, and of course favoring more renewables uh, in the mix. Uh, then there are more advanced levers like uh, uh, green hydrogen for example or uh, methane capture or carbon capture uh, as well. And it's important to understand obviously the economics of those levers. Start with the levers that have uh, the best economics, some of them actually, especially in energy efficiency, tend to have a positive NPV. So it's actually profitable without any specific regulation uh, to implement those levers. Uh, and then when, we further, when you go further right to the abatement curve, you start going into uh, territory where uh, innovation is required or heavy uh, investments are required. But those levers also become NPV positive if you start putting some carbon pricing into the equation, right? So it's a question of timing. And, and if I go back to the point around the strategy, it's important that the strategy adapts a little bit the pace uh, uh, of the change uh, to the scenarios as well and to the regulations uh, to see when some of the levers become uh, uh, positive uh, from an NPV perspective. Yeah. Okay, Lucas, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us today. Oh, welcome, what Thanks. a pleasure. For more insights and news analysis, please visit the Mining Review Africa YouTube page and please click subscribe.